It's been a little bit since I talked about Buffy. The world was simpler then. I'm afraid we have a slight apocalypse. Yes, I thought it was time I talked about everyone's favorite man in Tweed. Mr. Rupert Giles. Oh, Giles. Where to start? Maybe a little review. In my last video, I took a close look at suits and how over the centuries they have become a symbol of power, masculinity, and, well, patriarchy. I discussed how this plays out with the Watcher's Council. Their old-fashioned cuts and very expensive fabrics put one in mind of old established masculine power. The power of tradition and empire. This is the world that Giles comes from, the truth of the Watcher's Council. And I believe his relationship to the Council and what it represents can be traced through his costume, particularly his relation to suits. If we look at the jacket he wears in the first couple of episodes, it's a very conservative cut with a mid-century kind of look. Say, is that tweed? <laughs> Oh, uh, yes. Tweed is a fabric made from wool, often woven into a twill or herringbone pattern. It was created to withstand harsh Scottish and Irish weather. It's as tough as old boots, while also flexible and lasts for generations. The usually earthy mix of tones is achieved by dyeing the wool before it is spun and woven. That's how you get the expression, dyed in the wool. And boy, isn't that our Giles. I was ten years old, didn't I? father told me I was destined to be a watcher. He was one, and his uh, mother before him, uh, and I was to be next. Died in the wool, raised from birth for the Watcher's Council. But with Tweed, sometimes amongst the greens and browns, there can be threads of red. Along with his tweeds, he wears a collection of woolly vests and cardigans. The particular tweed of the jacket he's wearing here looks to be a Glasgow brown. And what does it say of someone who, while living in sunny Southern California, God, every day here is the same, would choose to wear two layers of wool made for Glasgow Dreek? That's, that's a choice. <laughs> that's a choice, Giles. Really? These early sweaters don't look particularly comfortable. They are serviceable and hard-wearing, like the tweed. There's little variation in Giles' wardrobe for the first season. I suspect they spent most of the budget on Buffy this season and did their best with what they had for Giles. Giles' color palette here is mainly earth tones, some greens and browns. It makes sense with him as a grounding influence and a figure of wisdom and learning. It's a pretty good setup for Giles as a mentor character, but uh, there's room for more depth to come. And now we get into season two, and there's more of a budget. A new jacket, still tweed, with a more modern cut. Anyway, by this point, we have an established look for Giles. But the question remains, is this look who Giles is, or is it a uniform for his job? Is there a difference between the man and his work? How much of the council is in the Watcher? We begin to get a hint that there might be more beneath the surface in the episode Halloween, with the arrival of Ethan Rain and the introduction of... Hello, Ripper. In this first interaction, Giles is still besuited, but notice how much darker his color palette gets. Halloween is also a good time to look at how much Tony Head can convey with just the loosening of a tie. The little touches, like this bit of business with a handkerchief. It's fabulous detail work, with the costume working for the actor. Tony Head really is a master of his craft. Ethan makes his second appearance in The Dark Age. And though it's it's a bit of a meh episode, there are some interesting character and costume details. For the first time, we meet Drunk Giles. Sloppy Drunk Giles. And Giles fully takes his tie off for the first time. Here we start to see the man beneath the tweed, that perhaps he's not as comfortable in the Watcher role as he once was. But in the crisis, he puts his jacket back on, brings back the structure, but over a rumpled shirt with no tie. And we also get a glimpse of who Giles once was as a young man, that he tried to reject the council and its values, that he once preferred leather to tweed. Hmm, I wonder if this will come up again. So the Dark Age sets up a bit of a pattern. In distress, Giles unbuttons and unravels bit by bit. For the rest of season two, we mostly see him in his suits. His ties often provide a hint of color, Shades of red coming in throughout his relationship with Jenny, red being the color of passionate feelings. And we see this in Passions, with the red and orange ties he wears, showing his feelings beneath the surface. 
that still waters run deep. And in the finale, we find him at the end of his rope in just a rumpled shirt, his costume taken from him against his will this time. By the close of season two, there's an established connection between Giles' suits and his role as Watcher, and the authority and responsibility that entails. When he's confident in it, the suits fit him well. When it's a strain, it shows. Season three. And the sweaters have gone. Maybe he's acclimatizing a little bit? Well, maybe not. He begins to wear waistcoats, making his suits look more of three-piece than two-piece. The three-piece is more traditional than the two-piece, and certainly more English. But it's a little more suitable to where he's living than a woolly jumper under a tweed jacket. Season three is the season of reflections and shadow selves. Giles has several reflections. There is the mayor, whose relationship with Faith is a dark mirror of Giles' own connection with Buffy. The return of Ethan and a look at his younger self. Three separate watchers and wish first Giles. Each reflection can be examined through costuming. Though there is little to say costume-wise in the comparison between the mayor and Giles. If you want my thoughts on the mayor's costuming, see my video on suits. And so we go to Ethan. Ethan belongs to Giles' past, to his rebellious phase when he rejected his path as a watcher. And of course, Ethan doesn't wear a suit. He's got this Bowie thing going on. No tie, no jacket, just a flouncy, satiny colored shirt. And in his reappearance in season three, he draws out that young rebellious part of Giles, takes him back to his past, which naturally involves a costume change. And boy, don't we all love band candy Giles. Joyce definitely does. And who can blame her? Okay, Buffy kind of does, but uh, anyway. Back to costume. And we have teenage-ish Giles in jeans, a tight white tee with sleeves rolled up, a plaid at his waist, and combat boots. I'm not sure how any of this was in his closet, and I really don't care. It's a great costume. It's got an early punk feel that makes sense for the era of Giles' teenagehood, while also being reminiscent of a 1950s greaser look. And it also wouldn't look out of place in 90s grunge. There's something of a timeless teenage rebel in this Ripper look. This guy has no time for suits and ties, no time for rules and responsibilities, and the man. Except, of course, that he is the man. He has responsibilities, and Buffy needs him to give up the candy and come back to himself. But this part of him is real and has roots. And now that Ethan has brought it out in him, can the genie ever fully go back in the bottle? Can he ever be as comfortable in his suits as he once was? Can he ever be as comfortable in his watcher role as he once was? The next reflection Giles encounters is the first of the three watchers. Gwendolyn Post, Mrs. Gwendolyn is the first to question Giles' commitment to the Watcher's Council and to his role, and questions his competence. She does it with an elegant passive aggressiveness, like a bone china teacup full of vinegar. I love her perfect twin sets and pearls. Very English upper middle class. Very much the feminine equivalent to the old-fashioned three-piece tweed. Her and Travers would make a matched set on an estate somewhere with an Aga and a Reigns Rover. And while she is serving him his teacup of vinegar... That was bracing. We get half-suited Giles. This vest and shirt combination is one we are going to see quite a bit of in Season 3. However, he fully suits up for the intervention with Buffy over Angel, as he's brought back to his sense of responsibility. And so, Ethan has brought out his rebellious side, and Mrs. Post has needled his growing disconnection with the Watcher's Council. And now, enter Quentin Travers. Travers is the very embodiment of the Council and all it stands for. And done this way for a dozen centuries. And he does it in an even more old-fashioned version of the tweed suit. He stands as a reminder of Giles' role and his responsibilities to the council, not to Buffy. His duty to the council, not to Buffy. And by framing his responsibility as to the council, Travers asks Giles to do something monstrous, something that is truly an archaic exercise in cruelty. And the cruelty is part of the point. This is ultimately about control. That is his duty, to control Buffy for them, to instrumentalize her for their agenda, and to let her die if they need her to. 
so they can find a new girl to control. That is their tradition. And it is tearing him apart. Here again we see touches of Red, his feelings bubbling beneath the surface. Who knows how it would have been resolved if circumstances hadn't pushed him to come forward. And in his confession scene, we see he is fully suited up, only his red tie is slightly askew, as he struggles to remain composed. When the crisis is over, he strips back some of his armor, and we see not only is he wearing red in his tie, but also his suspenders. He stripped himself of the clothes of his duty, and been stripped of that duty by the council. The role he has been struggling with, but also the one he was trained for, built his life around, his life's work, and it's been taken from him. And that work has been given to another, to a younger, more ambitious man, our third watcher, Wesley Wyndham Price. While Mrs. Post and Travers may have represented the traditions of the council, Wesley represents its intended future. He is bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, an ambitious company man through and through, with the snazzy, well-tailored suits to prove it. And Giles is so over it. As Wes runs around in his perfect suits, looking like a kid playing dress-up, Giles dresses down. He's frequently in shirt sleeves and a vest, and he's cool with it. He's still wearing some of the suit, still has his job as school librarian. He's still here for Buffy. He's just not going to follow the council anymore. And by the end of the season, neither is Buffy. Before we leave season three, there is one more costume to look at. One more reflection. Done. Wish first, Giles. This is who Giles would have been had he never been Buffy's watcher. And there is no suit. Instead, we get Giles in a comfy sweater. No watcher. Only Giles. But when Buffy arrives, when he gets to be watcher for a moment, he puts on a tweed jacket. So after three seasons, we've seen who Giles is as a watcher. We've seen him struggle to reconcile with the role he was groomed for and seen him choose Buffy over everything he knew. And we've also seen who he might have been if he hadn't had that role to begin with. And as we move into season four, we will see who he is when the role has been stripped from him. I love that the first glimpse of the new Giles is him in nothing but a robe. Without his job, he is actually kind of naked. I mean, he still has his lovely velour robe. He's not depressed at this point. He seems to be enjoying having no role, letting someone else wear his clothes for a bit, and letting Buffy fight her own battles. Well, trying to let Buffy fight her own battles. By the end of the episode, he knows he still wants to be part of the fight, he just doesn't quite know how. And this is the start of Sweater Giles. For most of the season, Giles wanders a bit aimlessly, wearing a series of very nice casual sweaters. Knitwear can be a bit warm for but it does look beautiful on film. The texture captures light beautifully, and his sweaters suit him very well. There is nothing like good knitwear for comfort and coziness. But the thing about knitwear on its own is it tends to lack structure, certainly in comparison to suits. And much as I love roguishly rumpled Rupert, he is suffering from the lack of structure. All of it is mostly in earth tones and greys, subtle colours. Mature colors. It's a good look, but a bit out of place when you look at the vibrancy that some of the other characters are wearing. Appropriate, as Giles is feeling out of place. We see this most clearly in The New Man. Here, Giles attempts a more formal look for Buffy's birthday by adding a blazer to his sweater look, but it ends up making him look even more out of place. Oh, poor Giles. Not only is he reckoning with not having a role to give him definition, now Buffy is looking to someone else for mentorship. Ouch. He clearly tries to dress up for this meeting, and also tries to look like he's not dressed up. But he totally has. Just like his act casual thing here. I'm sorry, I have things to do. I'll tell Buffy her friend was looking for her. Ouch. Oh, I wish we had more of these too. So, so, so. so this is what it feels like to match with someone at your level. What the hell is the catch? <laughs> Walsh is such an interesting reflection for Giles. She's in double knitwear here. This beautiful soft pink sweater and this grey cardi over her shoulders. It looks soft, yet the ribbing in the sweater works with the way the actor holds herself with this upright bearing. Not exactly rigid, but solid. She is tidy and together, and he... he is so not. And having found one reflection in Maggie Walsh, here comes his old reflection once again. It's Ethan. 
You have no idea how much thrashing you is going to improve my day. And this time, Ethan reflects something much closer to his current reality. This is how they each looked on the episode where they first met, and where Ethan returned, and again, and this is them now. They are dressed almost alike, both in deep chocolatey browns. And now, at his lowest, stripped of his position, seeing someone else supplant his place in Buffy's life, and wondering what became of himself, wondering what he has left to lose. What am I? I'm an unemployed librarian with a tendency to get knocked on the head. Now, Ethan tries to take the last of what makes him the human he is. Yet even now, even as he doesn't recognize his literal reflection, something of who Giles really is remains. Buffy, the person who means the most to him, still sees him for himself. <laughs> and then he tries on Ethan's wardrobe for a minute. But he knows he's still himself, even in that. But even if others see you, finding your way back to yourself can take time. And so we stay with Sweater Giles for some time this season. He's trying to find himself, and he tries on some variations on his look. Still, mostly Sweater Giles. And then in the Yoko Factor, as the gang's issues are boiling to the surface. And I'm not gonna miss a moment of it. His sweater comes off for proper comic relief. And the morning after finds Giles back where he started the season, in his cozy robe, but now alone and nursing quite the hangover. And there is no trace of the cool gentleman of leisure. But the sweater comes out for another outing as the group come together for the final battle of the season. Good work, team. In his restless dream, Giles cycles through all his previous incarnations, who he has been and who he is, a man at a crossroads. You gotta make up your mind, Roops. What are you wasting time for? And it's clear things have to change, but where will he go from here? A season five begins, and Giles has decided where he's going. Yeah, I'm, I'm going back to England. He can't hang around anymore and be the lost, rumpled sweater guy with no place in the world. And for the first time since New Man, he puts on a button-up collared shirt, only for the Dracu babes to rip it off him. But he made the effort. And after Dracula is dust, Giles finds himself not headed back to England, but staying. Staying because Buffy asks him. Because she needs him to take up the role he once had to put down for her. And with that, Giles has a mission again. And then he decides to take on a new role as well, one just for him. He's going into business. And as he steps into the role, his wardrobe changes. Okay, that change doesn't last. But first, the collared shirts return, open at first, and then buttoned up with a jacket. And finally, the occasional tie. He never goes fully back to the three-piece suits, and there's very little tweed in evidence. But as structure returns to his life, it returns to his wardrobe. Finally in Checkpoint, Travers, his old boss, makes his return. And now, though they are both in suits, Giles is modern and contemporary, and Travers is still mired in the past. When Buffy stands up to him, Travers is revealed to be little more than an empty suit, unable to intimidate as he once did. Whereas Giles stands as a proud mentor, watching his former charge come into her own. <laughs> And as she does, he gets his position back. Vindication. And now Giles can work for a place of balance, wearing a structured suit when he needs to, and a comfy sweater when he's more relaxed or needs more ease of movement for fighting. And in the closing act of season five, Giles wears this beautiful and quite functional coat, beige. The beige is important here. While not being overly simplistic, the Buffyverse often is a world of black and white, of heroes and villains. But while Giles has always been part of our group of protagonists, we could question whether he has been a hero. I swear, one of these times you're going to wake up in a coma. If he is, he's not an untainted one. Beige is a color we see with the Watchers, with the people who see themselves as doing what's necessary to keep the world safe, not necessarily what is heroic. And that's exactly what Giles believes he is doing here. The necessary thing. He doesn't see himself as a hero. He even puts on his glasses to see as clearly as possible exactly what he is doing. It's a dark moment. 
Yet it's a moment of integration, bringing his dark rebellious side to use for the mission for Buffy. And Buffy is going through an integration of her own separately, in her sacrifice and in her resurrection. Oh God, Buffy. You're alive. But it means there isn't really a place for Giles in Sunnydale anymore. Not in his mind. He stays for a time, and his wardrobe continues in the same balance that he found through season five. And Giles leaves in beige and brown. But he returns in gray and black. I'd like to test that theory. <laughs> Is this the best entrance in the show? Quite possibly. It's, it's good. Man, I love this coat too. It's sleek and black and almost full length. The popped collar too. He radiates power and strength as he never has before. And he's come back with a plan to save the day. After a hug and a giggle fest. But yeah, he has come to help. And he does. In a roundabout sort of way. He helps, as he has always done. As a teacher and a guide. And it's beautiful. Season 7 is tricky where Giles is concerned. He only appears a handful of times. And it makes his arc sort of unclear. Costume-wise, he continues in the same layered look he established by season 6. He wears a lot of browns, dark, rich earth tones. Giles ends the series in a grey sweater with a dark jacket. The earth is definitely doomed. A sweater Giles look, yes, but with some structure. I can imagine this cycle of structure to no structure is going to be a balancing act he continues, that this is part of who Giles is. But for this story... That's the end of his arc. I truly love Giles. And not just because Tony Head is talented and, well, shall we say a remarkably handsome human. Did anyone ever tell you you're kind of a sexy funny daddy? Like, before he was Giles, he managed to make instant coffee sexy, and, and like, it's instant coffee. <laughs> but it's the character I love. His story. It's not a traditional story. But then he isn't the hero of this story. The show is a coming-of-age story, and Giles has done his coming-of-age. So the stories we find ourselves in in middle age are different from those of the young ones. Giles is a story of readjustment and reevaluation, of how one responds when you realize that the things you are raised to believe and the institutions you were taught to support are harming people. He gives us an example of how we can rebuild from loss, and how to serve and to care for others without losing ourselves. Fran Kazooie once said that it is not enough to teach our girls to be Buffy, we have to teach our boys to be Xander. But I would posit that what we really need is, as adults, to teach ourselves to be Gileses, to learn to redefine. And that is who Giles is, behind the blue eyes, behind the tweed. He is a teacher learning to be a better teacher, a mentor learning to be a better mentor, and a man learning to be a better man. I think it's bloody brilliant. Poor watcher. Has your life passed before your eyes? Cup of tea, cup of tea. Almost got shagged. Cup of tea. 